This is the author Siobhan MacDonald. She was in with us in the library today to do a reading from her latest book, Guilty. This is a taster for a longer interview we have coming up with her for Limerick's Lifelong Learning Festival. So I hope you enjoy. Hi everyone, um, I'm delighted to have Siobhan MacDonald with us today. This is part of uh, the Lifelong Learning Festival in conjunction with Limerick City and County Libraries. And Siobhan's going to do a reading from her book, Guilty. Uh, it's out in paperback now, and she has another book coming out on the 29th of July, The Bike Collector. But this is a small taste of Guilty, and once you've heard a small bit, I think you'll want to read it all. So I'll just hand over to Siobhan and say thank you. Thank you, Marie. Luke. Saturday the 13th of April. Something told Luke not to watch, to turn away, that he'd be sorry if he looked. But his eyes were drawn above him where he stood. A white flash seared overhead. It gathered mass and started falling. It tumbled, spinning ever downwards, ever brilliant against the darkening sky. In a drunken pirouette, it cast a spinning shadow as it fell towards the earth. Luke was in the preacher's path. He stepped aside just in time. There was a sickening thud as it hit the ground. The preacher quivered inches from him. It was mangled, its neck was broken, and its blood-soaked feathers splayed as if reaching out. It blinked with a glazed eye, and he shied back. The preacher shuddered and gave a long, low, piteous moan. Luke bolted upright against his pillow, convinced that he cried out. Sophie? The woman beside him was breathing gently, her long hair tousled, tired from the night before. Luke sat shaking, a cold sweat prickling his brow. He stared nervously into the dark, listening to the sound of the water lapping outside. It had been a while since the white bird called to see him. And that's the first page. Thanks so much for that, Jamie. So that's a great taster of what's to come in the book. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to Camellic Library. Uh, as part of the Lifelong Learning Festival, we're delighted to have the esteemed author Siobhan MacDonald here with us today. Uh, Siobhan has written three different books now. She's written her first one is called Twisted River. Uh, second one is The Blue Pool. The Blue Pool. Sorry yes. about that. Just my memory for a second. And her latest one is called Guilty, which recently came out in paperback. She also has a book coming out shortly. It's called Bride Collectors. It'll be out on the 29th of July, so make sure you get it. Uh, Siobhan has a, a varied career. She started off um, in NUIG Galway, where she studied engineering, and that led her to become a technical writer, um, which she pursued for a number of years. And finally, she went into her final vocation of becoming a full time author and a very good full time author as well. So, welcome, very good. To Kamala Siobhan, thank you for coming this morning. Um, so, just to start off, can I just ask you? Uh, I mentioned there about your career and how you started off. Yes. Um, how do you feel that you were learning on your studies that you undertook helped you in your writing career? Well, there were always elements of uh, writing along the way. Uh, as you mentioned, I was in NUIG and um, I uh, did a, my degree in electronic engineering. And I knew that the engineering, so I didn't want to be uh, working in a lab, soldiering away, working with PCBs or anything like that. So um, I had uh, investigated the role of maybe tech journalism and I had gone for a few interviews there. And then I discovered it was very new at the time. This, uh, profession of technical writing. I mean, now you have, uh, you can do diplomas in technical writing 
and degrees in technical writing even in uh, UL, I think those are uh, really uh, uh, very well uh, regarded. And I uh, actually saw an ad for a job as a technical writer, uh, it was advertised in the Irish Times uh, in Scotland. So uh, that was hugely appealing to me because uh, not alone, uh, if I was lucky enough to get a job and I uh, came through the interview, would I be able to write? But secondly, I'd be able to go to Scotland. So I had all these really erratic notions of Scotland from all the Lillian Beckwith novels that I'd read as a kid. So I um, was lucky enough to uh, get the job. There was this huge big uh, uh, series of interviews uh, in Chile's and Dublin, I remember. And uh, I was lucky enough to get that job. So uh, they trained me up uh, as I was working uh, in the technical writing department. And uh, that was really how I kind of managed to. I, I was trying to visualize it. It's a little bit like um, I was going one way. And if you think about you know, a cruise liner, I think about the cruise liners at the moment, all these ships that were stuck in the, uh, the Suez Canal. Yes. Uh, I felt like my career was going that way. I mean, if you think about cruise liners out in the ocean, how long it takes them to turn just ever so slightly, and it might be a few degrees, a few degrees, a few degrees, and it can take a while to turn. But I would say that was the kind of initial turning point for me when I discovered uh, that you could uh, work as a writer and work in tech. So that was my that was my start, really. Um, and from there, uh, I. Tried to do creative writing on the side, and uh, I wrote some little bits and pieces for. Uh, well, I entered little bits and pieces in, into competitions for Scotland on Sunday and various uh, newspapers and magazines in Scotland. So I kind of kept the creative writing going on the side, and I would take time off work and holidays off work and, and do that. So um, that was, I guess, well, one of the starts. But if I, if I go back even further. Um, I guess you could say that my writing career probably started when I was in school, really, because I used to write uh, these dramatic duologues, and myself and my friend would have to write a couple of people remember a competition. There used to be a, uh, an Irish competition called Sloka. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And um, I had written a lot of poetry for that, and uh, I also started doing uh, Spondi's Angela Berta, which was a conversation between uh, two people. And uh, I would write the scripts, and myself and uh, my friend, my Trace, would um, act them out on the stage. And it was an opportunity to go you know, to the dizzy, um, big smoke in Dublin and go to Dunleary and perform these uh, little duologues on stage. So I started doing little bits and pieces of creative writing in school. Mm -hmm. And um, also, then I was, it's nice to get a little bit of um, kind of. Um, recognition along the way and something that will inspire you um, and encouragement from uh, people and I, back in the days of the exams, the old intercerts, the junior search, now whatever essay I had done for um, the intercert, uh, actually it was an Irish essay, uh, I did get um, recognition from the Department of Education for a uh, medal for which was for Commerce Soil, which, which was for uh, creativity. So I thought, well, you know, so maybe, yeah, I'll, maybe, maybe, I'll, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll do kind of something, maybe uh, I can work on this. And that was hugely encouraging. And did doing it, writing as a, for the first start, anyways, as a career, as a technical job, did that help your writing process in terms of finding discipline afterwards? Or was it something that you write in a different way than you write in fiction as opposed to writing for, for to someone else's brief? Yeah. Uh, well, there were a lot of things that I learned in technical writing in particular. Um, because when you're, uh, if I think back to my days in the company that I worked uh, for NCI, I mean, the cash machines and the cash readers and interactive journals, I was there at the um, get go for all of those kinds of uh, specialty interactive journals. Um, the process there would be if you had a, a new product, you uh, as a writer you'd be involved with uh, meetings with uh, product development, QA, software engineers, manufacturing, um, uh, integration, uh, engineering. So you were involved in the whole process. But your part in that process 
was to create what was called an audience task matrix. So you would have to identify the um, tasks that needed to be described and the audiences uh, that needed that information. And out of that would fall um, possibly a list of user guides, installation guides, uh, product descriptions, online help, all that kind of thing. And then the next level down from that was where there was, let's say, um, an overlap between technical writing and starting out to write uh, a novel, a um, fiction novel, where you do what's called, um, with technical writing, you do what's called a unit plan, where you plan out all the various sections of your tech manual, and you might have a heading, subheading, uh, a paragraph uh, about what's going to go into that section, and any illustrations that you thought the uh, graphic designers need to do. So that process um, was hugely helpful. Um, and I'm not saying I will stop to it yes, yeah. when you're coming to more or less design um, a piece of fiction because you know you will have your uh, your 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 opening third, your middle third and your last third. And I guess I do. Um, most writers are like either plotters or plotters. Yes. And I kind of do a mix of both. Yes. I try and take on board what I learned from technical writing in uh, creating an outline, mm -hmm. and then you'd have I would put in a few subheadings underneath that, and little ideas, and maybe mind maps, and then work with that broad outline to try and. Uh, you know, you to get the bare bones of the novel in that way. Right? So that, that's something that I learned uh, from technical writing. Yeah. yeah. So it creates a structure that you can hang the story on. Exactly. Yeah. It, it does, yeah. 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 You, 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 you break the structure. Yeah. yeah. And actually, you can see that in your writing. It creates uh, sort of um, a plan throughout, in that each chapter there is something that it comes on, like it's something dropped in that is going to come back later on, something I really enjoyed. That there are little things said here and there. Yes. Okay, you know, I wonder what's that about or what's that in reference yeah. to. Um, yeah. And actually, one another aspect actually of your writing that I noticed particularly was the use of atmosphere in terms of the setting, the location, the environment. Um, it almost is the extra character in the book, so I, I felt. Um, is that something that you're consciously doing or is it something that's important to you? Well, I think. Um we might be a little bit uh, spoiled for choice here and there mm. because um, we have so many wonderful backdrops. And in the genre in which I write, which is kind of crime thrillers, suspense, um, the landscape is very much uh, a feature. And I, somebody else pointed this out to me uh, recently, and I don't think I've consciously done it, but I do tend to set my novels near water yes yeah. and uh i kind of uh, think that you know somebody this person who was interviewing me said you know well, why do you, you, you set your novels near water and i think it is if you if you think um it's very relaxing to watch something move mm -hmm. uh, and it's a bit like sitting in front of the fire watching flames yes. that's very relaxing to watch mm -hmm. and being by water is very Relaxing. And I think it inspires some kind of creative thought in you when you buy water. It makes you think a little bit differently. I don't know if it's something to do with your pathways or yes. anything like that. And then I was also thinking, I remember a module that I had done in uh, college and it was on hydraulics. Mm -hmm. It came back to me recently and it was about how water moves. Mm -hmm. And if I remember correctly, um, if you have water flowing, let's say, in a channel in it, on a river bank, uh, the water will seem to move, the, the water molecules will seem to move uh, very, very slowly uh, close to the river bank. But underneath, things are flowing very, very differently and a lot quicker. And I think it's this kind of this idea of maybe there's kind of some subliminal thought process going on there, this kind of um, undercurrents. So that's a, a great metaphor for your writing because. That's exactly what they're responding to. It's a message for people in the situation. And as I said, it's, it's a, you know, a fine thriller situation. Yes. But 
there's always something going on in their background, or something that we need to find out, or they will slowly reveal to us as time goes. And actually, even taking your water metaphor, that there can actually be something like that blocks or sense and things change. Yes. And there's something going, oh, I didn't see that coming. Yes. But that's, I suppose, the nature of it that you're, you're kind of leading, you're following it through. Creating a path, yeah, and then we're following it, and you're not quite sure exactly what's going to happen. Well, I guess, uh, in, uh, to a certain extent as well, um, the way I write is very much dictated by the genre, yeah, uh, because you, with crime thrillers and suspense, you do have to have that element of surprise, mm -hmm. and you have to have this. If you're doing it well. Mm -hmm. um, of course, as a writer, you're always learning, and sometimes it doesn't always come off. And you know, the book is you continue to write that you know your techniques and it will improve. Mm -hmm. But if you're doing this well, you have this constant undercurrent of tension, which also then leads to prizes, as you say. And just to get back to your your question on the landscape, yes. Some of the la landscapes that we have, and where I've set uh, my novels, lend themselves very much to. Kind of mystery because you have, um, for example, uh, in the Bugu, which is set between uh, Galway and the Burren. And the Burren has a very, very mysterious landscape in that you have this it, it, the, the karst and the lines you've done with all these bikes and gullies, but you know, you've got wonderful uh, flora and flora in it. And if you're ever in the Burren, if the, the mist can descend out of nowhere, it can lift just as quickly. You've got the Atlantic coming in uh, over you. And also, a lot of the uh, activities that take place there, when you have people who go caving for the life of me. Yeah. I can't understand the idea of going caving. But the idea that you could go in underneath this huge big grass plateau and find all these undiscovered caves. Like, you know, the island caves are now discovered, but there's lots of little caverns and uh, almost underground dungeons yes. underneath that plateau. Um, so that's a very kind of atmospheric landscape. And then with uh, Twisted River, I set half of it in Limerick and half of it in New York. And you have the atmosphere of the Shannon and this little. Uh, terraced house overlooking the shadow and you know medieval castle in the background and that's very atmospheric and just to have those that the uh, landscapes they're very inspirational mm -hmm. and guilty them uh, set on a, uh, a lake in clear I mean I as I was writing guilty in the back of my mind I, I do have a lot of cinematic influences mm -hmm. as well because there's such a kind of a crossover moment between what's happening in the world of uh, cinema and television, yes. and also in the written word. And when I watched, I remember in particular one series, uh, Brian's series that made a big impact on me was True Detective. Yes. And that was set in these uh, swamp lands. Oh, yeah. These, yeah, swamp lands. And to me, there are parts of West Clare in particular, out around the head, you've got all these fantastic marshlands and uh, full of bog cotton and. Uh, it's quite flat in parts. Um, as somebody described it to me recently, it's very honest. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, and I kind of thought this is just so like the back, you know, you could do an Irish version of uh, True Detective here. So um, when I was uh, writing Guilty, that was kind of in, in the back of my mind as well. And um, of course, then you have the, the Lake Sinclair and all these wonderful houses in Clare too. Yeah, and it's, 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 I suppose that that's really interesting you're saying about um, taking with a visual kind of mind to things as well. Yes. Because and that's when something is written where it kind of, you can actually imagine the scene of it. You can, you can picture the, the weather, the landscape, environment. Even if you haven't been there, it does create um, a sort of a, a code or something that's going on. Yes. You know, it's like the darkness when it feels like a cave or water. Yes. They all kind of create something that the reader it gets intrigued or gets yeah. ripped into. Um, when you're look, talking about the, say, in general, the crime genre, it seems to be that there's a lot of new Irish writers. Um, it's, they, they're afraid of the, the use of the Celtic noir 
And, and do you think that in general that authors are pick up a lot from their own environment, so they reflect what's going on at the moment. And you know, they seem to kind of have we've got more of the slightly darker points on it now in a lot of writing. Certainly since around uh, 2006, because that was around the time um, my first novel, uh, Twisted River, was published. And at that time, this whole Celtic noir thing was, it was just the start of it. Yeah. And I don't know, I think in a way, maybe people didn't feel that they had the license, writers didn't feel that they had the license to do the crime thriller, mm -hmm. as you know, I read lots of um, British based mm -hmm. crime thrillers, and I remember in particular living in Edinburgh and uh, reading the Ian Rankin books and reading all about Rebus. And it was a thrill for me to live in a city where I knew all of these locations. But that at the time wasn't happening to the same extent mm -hmm. in Ireland. So I think once you've seen one or two writers do it, you kind of think, well, why not? Why not set, set a novel in Limerick? Why not set a novel in Burn? Why not set a novel in Kerry? Why not set a novel in Clare? Um, now that there, there's a kind of a, uh, it, it's like the, the rolling stone getting bigger and bigger, yes. um, there is huge interest uh, in that. Definitely. And it, will there be a sort of uh, camaraderie between Irish authors in, in general? Or obviously, you, you, you're all publishing different things at different times. Yes. I presume to some extent you're all going to different festivals or were in previous times. So, is there sort of um, a little, I'd like to imagine there's a sort of a, a writer's club somewhere that, uh, that all the Irish authors meet up, or is that just reimagining something? No, I think that uh, certainly there is uh, there are very very supportive you know, uh, group of writers, and they will always uh, support you in any way uh, that they can. And I don't know if, the, if there is a club. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about it. Um, but you were talking about uh, festivals, mm -hmm. and I was lucky enough to be. I, I think. At the only live festival that actually happened last year um, at the uh, Drummondia and Nina Literary mm -hmm. Festival, yeah, yeah. and that was really fun because I get to meet I got to meet uh, Patricia Gibney, mm -hmm. um, who I believe is uh, I was talking to a friend of mine who just recently retired from the library service, and uh, she was saying that Patricia was the most requested uh, author that she had. So that was lovely to meet yeah. uh, Patricia, and of course, I'm delighted to have yes. a little round on yeah. my book, a little poem she very generously reviewed my book, yeah. um, and uh, Catherine Clareman as well, and um, Kat Hogan was also a brand manager. So that was lovely to be able to have the chance before yeah. and afterwards, even though it was very um, socially distanced yeah. and it wouldn't it wasn't the same as it would have been at any other time. Yeah. Yeah. And just when you're talking about books, obviously uh, while writing has been a huge part of your life, has your reading style or or what you've read um, through your life influenced your work or changed your writing or is it are you do you, are you able to still read while you're actually writing something? Well, that's a two part story. Yeah. Um, yes, no, I just don't think um, I read a lot uh, when I was a teenager um, and, and as a child, and, and just like so many other writers, I started off with, uh, you know, Black and then, you know, the Nancy Drews yes. and all the mystery books and um, when we do kidnapped. Um, but I then kind of moved on to more adult books that I read then would have been uh, the Dick Francis novels, the Alistair McLean novels, all those kind of uh, thriller novels. And also then, when you were going on holidays in Ireland, you'd have to take a big book that would last you for the whole holiday. And so if you'd take the big book that you could get out of the library that would last you for the holiday, and I used to, uh, I remember 
reading a, a lot of the James Fitchner books mm -hmm. like Hawaii um, and and of course there were the uh, books that caused a scandal at the time like the Thorn Birds by Colleen McCollum. Mm -hmm. So my right my reading uh, was uh, very varied as I say a lot of uh, crime mystery and then anything else really very broad range of uh, books. But when I started off, uh, the second part was how did that? Yeah, it's just that I often wonder if someone who does enjoy reading, yes. if you're trying to write something, is it difficult then? Uh, you know, do you stop reading because in case you comes to see thing, or just because you're reading something else that's not your voice? So when you write, it's it's that you you're yes. taking on something from what you've recently read. Yeah. I actually find that I I don't necessarily have the concentration to read when I'm writing it. Because when I'm writing, the characters are in my head, mm -hmm. the landscape's in my head, uh, the, their dialogue, their conversations are in my head, and I find if I... I would dip in and out of uh, books, but I, I, I don't know that they would get my whole heart's attention, and I would tend to actually not to read in my own genre yeah. when I'm writing because I don't want somebody else's uh, voice yeah. in my head. Mm -hmm. um, and you just, it's almost like you have this bubble around mm -hmm. you and you're in this, your own little world until yeah. that book is done and then you can leave it aside and uh, let it, you know, ferment and mellow until Perfect. you go back. Yeah. And have another look at it, and then think, you know, when you do your second draft, your third draft, or whatever. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I tend not to read in my genre mm -hmm. when I'm writing. And also, it's, um, yeah, my characters do keep me awake at night, mm -hmm. and you know, you can be lying in bed thinking, mm -hmm. what would they say here? What would they do here? What would they do there? And then the whole plot twist mm -hmm. things um, that's going around in your head. So. We to try and have a little bit of sanity. Yes, yeah, it's simple. Yeah. yeah. So you, it, it's almost like you have to keep the barrier in your own universe that yes. you've created. That's right. Yeah. Yes. And actually, when you have great characters, they're they're all very believable. They're all, to some extent, I can see with some of them. You can see aspects of them in our society, or you know, they're not caricatures of people. Yes. They are real people with. Different layers, yes, um, and that's what makes them interesting to read. Yes, um, but when they're, do they, I suppose, do they come to you? Do they how do they come to you fully formed, or do you have to sort of work on them? Do the characters change over time as you're writing, or do you have a sort of idea of where they're going to go? There would be for each character, you uh, I would, I have maybe two or three character traits, mm -hmm. and I start off with those. And I build up a picture then as I put them in to certain situations, and then I figure out how they would react. But going back to your point about you know uh, some of these characters, you could see them in Irish yeah. life. I'm not sure if you're speaking about those particularly. Yes, well, well, Cornelius definitely. Um, Cornelius, definitely. Um, Cornelius, he's just such a bore. Isn't he, he? he is. He, he is. is such a bore. But he's yeah. very believable as one. And he's not yes. irredeemable, he's never totally. He's a, a real person in the yes. sense that he's yeah. not someone who just stands for what people to see. Yes. He has his good points too. Yes. Not many, but he does have good points. But that's what makes it interesting that he is uh, a multifaceted character. Yeah. Um, so that, that's why I kind of, yeah, similar sight of also his daughter, of course. Well, yes, she's. Uh, She's quite a ticket. She is. She, yeah. She's just, you know, in a way, I know this uh, guilty is Luke's story and what happens mm -hmm. to Luke and the situation that he has to resolve and his huge, big moral dilemma, because yeah. it's a big moral dilemma yeah. part of, of guilty. But really, in a way, he is, even though he's the main character, he's almost like a foil yes. for Alison. His wife, you know. um, because he's just so he's so focused on his career, he doesn't really see the world around him, 
and he doesn't see the nuances of the world around him. Whereas Alison, she is somebody you could imagine very much in Irish yeah. public now because she's very represented, yeah. she's very charming, she knows how to speak to her uh, constituents, she has worked uh, for various charities, she's thought of as a, an untouchable charity yes. queen, um, she is uh, very much involved in the lives of the people around her and knows everything. But really, uh, her motivations are, well, you probably have to read the book, right? her motivations are less than, uh, less than Christian. Yeah. Less Very than Christian. Christian. And that, that's the interesting point is that while Luke is a central character, yes. to some extent, some events are not within his control. And that's, that's right. where the interest lies of yes. what could he have controlled or yeah. what could he not control. Yes. So that's that's what makes the characters interesting. Yes. He's maybe at the centre. Yes. Every everyone else's actions cause reactions yes. or cause actions to him. Yes. So that's how that's why I enjoyed it particularly the way it unfolded in that. Yes. We feel obviously if certain people had not reacted the way they did, yes. his the consequences of actions would be very different. I'm trying not to say anything too I know, but really, I mean, what it was was, um, but just to say uh, one thing about Alison, I noticed a huge difference uh, between living in the UK and then when I came back to Ireland. In the UK, politics has changed hugely worldwide, every, you know, in, in so many countries. But politics in the UK at the time that I lived there was very much you had uh, two parties. You had Labour and uh, the Conservatives. And the politics there was very much agenda driven. Mm -hmm. And then coming back to Ireland, politics and politics in Ireland really, really is just local politics. That's really what matters to people. It's not, I mean, I know we have two parties, but really there's not much of a difference between them. No, no. And I really do wonder if there is an agenda there. I think not. I think it's more local. Um, because I remember a canvasser coming around to the door in the last election, and I did say to him, I said, well, you know, what do you stand for? And uh, he said, well, I'm here to represent you. You know, whatever you want yourself. Yeah. And I just thought, that is the difference. Yeah. Um, it's not agenda driven. It's, I, you know, there's a lot of the God God we bring you can I sort that for you. And that's such um, an interesting landscape to exploit a book like this. And it, it's interesting you call in general because when you have people who have weaknesses and have flaws, yes. then that's where the suppose the chinks come in, yeah. where you can say, well, you know. You could say, as a person, I might have done that, yes, but you don't know until you. Well, exactly. I, I wanted to create a situation that everybody could imagine yeah. themselves in, and I wanted to explore for myself, actually, yeah. as well, what I might do in a situation like this. And as I, as I said, and, and, and you know, that's a huge moral, something happens and there's a huge moral dilemma at the heart of the story. And it kind of, this, it was inspired by something that I'd seen uh, in the media, with them, um, uh, TV, radio, and the newspapers. Mm -hmm. And what I wanted to do was kind of roll back from this particular incident mm -hmm. and try and imagine a set of circumstances where what happened could be understandable. Mm -hmm. To try and explain why somebody who was upstanding, really ordinary decent citizen, yeah. up until that point, mm -hmm. why they might have done what they had done. And it, it again, uh, going back to what I remembered, went to see a very disturbing play one time in. Uh, the Dundee Rep Echoes a couple of weeks. Yes, yes. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's really quite it's disturbing. Yeah. And uh, I found uh, a book 
at home actually, um, uh, Peter Schaefer's uh, play, and was forward in the, in, the, in the beginning of the weekends, or the beginning books, and he explained that uh, he'd heard the story, I think it was back on the day weekend, he was in his car, and he heard the story of these horses being named uh, at a stables nearby, and he, he got to thinking, you know, how, how would somebody do something like that? Why would they do something like that? Is there any rationale for doing something like that? Can it be understandable? Probably never acceptable, can it, but can it be understandable? And that was really what I tried to set out to do with this, uh, to, explore a situ to explore all the layers and how the situation might have come about and why somebody might have reacted like this. And do you think that as a writer then, with that level of nuance of what was interesting, you yeah. have to be interested in people? Oh, yes. what, and you have to, you know, you have to kind of look at people and observe them yes. and take in different characteristics. Yes. Do you, I know obviously you, you were keeping up with the scenario you mentioned where you, you, you got inspiration through a real life event. Yes. Do you ever see characters in real life that can only be raised in a, in a book? You know, are they some of their, some yes. of their motivations or their um, yes. positive things about them? Yes. Maybe something I can use again afterwards. Yes. Well, certainly, I have come across uh, a lot of charming people. And then, you know, you find out actually there's a lot of very charming people who are actually sociopaths. Mm -hmm. They know very well how to connect with people, but that's because they know how to manipulate them. Right. Um, so, a lot of the, they don't need to be um, famous people, they don't need to be people in the media. Oftentimes, people in small towns, ordinary people, can be really good inspiration for Potter or uh, a fine novel, and certainly, um, I like the idea, the idea of um, exploring the you know, the small town yeah. big secrets. Mm -hmm. And you know, Ireland is a network. Apart from we have a few big urban centres, but apart from that, we're just a network of of towns and villages, yeah. and along with our history. Um, and because of our history, I think sometimes the smaller the town, the bigger the secret. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I have um, developed, that idea, I've developed that idea in my next book, The Bride Collector. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we often, well, we grew up, I heard a lot growing up from uh, people around me. Um, at school, uh, and often it would be used as an admonishment. He would be told, it's being bail at us. You know, silent mouth is the best mouth to have. You know, silence is gold. And I think that probably, if you explore that notion of being bail at us, that probably comes from, that even could come back, I, that could even come from the time of, you know, the Irish Civil War. Yeah. Where families are split and, and you absolutely just don't say anything. Sorry, you say nothing. Say nothing. Yeah. Because the tighter communities are, the closer you live with people, the more dangerous it is to open your mouth. And everybody has their secrets and just keep the layers. Keep the layers. Yeah. Yes. And that's really interesting. Yeah. And so we look forward actually to, to the right lines coming out in July. I yeah. have to say, Guilty was a great read. Um, Thank you so much. It's really created, as I mentioned, you created a great atmosphere, and there is some great twists, and so I would highly recommend it. It will be available in all the libraries as well. Um, and we are open again, and I'd like to really thank Siobhan for trying to do a fun twist and talk with us. It's been really interesting, and uh, hopefully, we'll see you all again soon. And thank you to the libraries, and thank you to the Life Online.